going on there. This is Dr. Lori Kirschenbaum. He's the director of the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences, principal investigator of Cardiac Gene Biology Lab in the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences, professor in the Department of Physiology and Pathophysiology and Pharmacology and Therapeutics at the University of Manitoba. He's also the Canada Research Chair for Molecular Cardiology at the University of Manitoba and Director of Research Development, Max Rady College of Medicine, Rady Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. So, I'm going to share... There we go. I think we have Dr. Kirchenbaum. Welcome here, Dr. Kirchenbaum. Hi. Hi, thanks for volunteering some of your time with us today. Um, so that was a huge list of job titles that you have. You're sort of dividing your time here between the Albertson Research Center and the University of Manitoba. Um, director is maybe a title that some people are familiar with. They see you're the director of the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences here. And you also run your own lab as a principal investigator. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what your, what is your sure. job? <laughs> what are your thank jobs? You, you. Sure. So um, you, you touched a lot of uh, my leadership and the rectorship roles, but let me tell you a little bit about what we do. So the Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences, which is located in the Albertson uh, Research Center at St. Barnabas Hospital in Winnipeg, um, is one of the premier cardiovascular research uh, programs in Canada. Um, our program is comprised of a number of investigators, researchers that are studying how uh, heart disease uh, affects human uh, life. And uh, we know that heart disease is one of the number one, is in fact the number one killer next to cancer um, in Canada and North America. And our group uh, is doing research, finding new therapies and cures to uh, improve the quality of life in heart disease. So um, you mentioned that you have a number of uh, fancy titles, and one title um, is the, uh, I run my own lab, director of my own lab. And so my lab is interested in understanding why the cells that make up the heart die when people have heart attacks. And a heart attack is really a situation that occurs when the oxygen but uh, the oxygen within our blood uh, is decreased and the uh, heart muscle cells become starved, they die. And when the heart muscle cells die, the heart's ability to pump blood decreases and as a result, it, re it, it leads to something that we call heart failure. And heart failure is a major uh, form of heart disease. So that's what my lab studies and we're interested in the genetic pathways, and some of the different um, uh, elements that cause heart disease and it's it's one lab within maybe 14 within the unit and so uh, there are different uh, components or different pieces of, of heart disease I study heart failure other uh, uh, researchers in our program uh, study different uh, avenues of heart disease because it could be caused by more than one one thing smoking diet lifestyle yeah we and sort so, of when we talk with students or kind of introduce the idea of heart disease and how scientists study it, we kind of describe these disease problems as, you know, like a huge puzzle right. where one lab might be studying one piece of that puzzle and your piece is what are the genes involved in heart disease, right. but other right. labs might be studying other, other cells or other reasons that's, behind the problem. That's exactly true. So we all work together and um, different pieces of the puzzle. And so while my lab itself contributes one part of the puzzle, there's other um, individuals, other investigators, researchers that contribute to the other part of the puzzle. So I direct a program uh, within the Institute that manages or oversees all the cardiovascular research activity uh, with, within the group. And so while uh, everybody is playing with the different uh, puzzles, I'm working with them to try to assemble the different pieces. So you kind of connect everyone with what everybody else is doing to make sure that we're all kind of sharing. That's right. Sharing is caring. You say sharing that about is caring. And if you ever put a, a puzzle together, um, you know that there are many pieces when you look at the big picture. And uh, if there's a piece that's missing, um, you can't complete the, uh, the puzzle itself. Yeah. So uh, we need to work together and we work as a team and a uh, very cohesive team. And um, it's uh, a lot of uh, a lot of work by a lot of people. So, um, 
I was going to ask you a little bit more about your particular lab a bit later, um, but I did also want to share, you know, you've been here for quite a long time. Um, here's young Kirschenbaum back when, was this when you started at the research center? Like, can you uh, tell us a little bit about your pathway, sure, you know, like sure. where did you, where did you study, where did you grow up and, you know, what does it take to go from being, you know, like sure. high school student to director of all things cardiac research? Sure, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think very on as a child, I was always very inquisitive and had this uh, interest in understanding how the body worked and in particularly the heart. And so um, my career path um, in junior high and high school took me down a road of uh, science. And um, that's why I had focused at a university. I had taken science courses and uh, completed a bachelor degree and a master degree and a PhD degree. And then I- Did so um, you do all of that here in Manitoba? Did all that in Manitoba. You travel? We did this, I did this all in Manitoba. And then um, after my uh, graduate training, I went to uh, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and I lived in the States, the U.S. for several years. And uh, then I was recruited back uh, to Winnipeg um, to run my own uh, lab. And over the years, so it's now close to 30 years, uh, and uh, now I've uh, moved through the system in a way where uh, research has developed and my uh, program within the unit has flourished and now just taken on more administrative and leadership roles in is, uh, running the program. Is, has it come full circle now that you're out there headhunting the future science leaders within our our ICS division? Yeah, and you know what's really interesting, Megan? You asked an interesting question. You know, where did it start again? And, you know, short of, it, you know, short of my own interests, you know, in, in science and in research, I had worked as a summer student in uh, a lab, a medical research lab, um, in high school and in, in the early years of university. And it's interesting when you mention now I'm looking to recruit new people in these areas. We offer um, not only through the bio lab is that, you're, that you're running, but also we have uh, studentships for uh, people in you know high school and university who work in our labs. And that's where the start began for me. Uh, I got exposed uh, to uh, science as a or research, as a uh, young uh, high school, early university student. And uh, that's where the career uh, goal took off. So yes, I am now promoting that uh, heavily. I think it starts, the interest starts at an early age. And uh, the idea is to inspire young people to uh, do uh, medical research, medicine, um, whether it's through practicing medicine as a doctor, uh, seeing patients in a hospital or office, or doing uh, research uh, kind of at the same lines that I do. Has it, has it always been heart science that was your major interest? Was that one of the first labs you came into, or how did that pursuit kind of begin? So my interest has always been uh, heart disease and trying to understand um, why, as I mentioned earlier, the cells of a heart die when people have heart attacks. This is a major problem, and largely because heart muscle cells don't divide or repair after they become damaged. So most cells of the body, liver, skin, when we cut our skin um, for whatever reason, the skin muscle, the skin cells grow back, and we get sometimes a, a small scar, but essentially the skin repairs itself. The heart muscle doesn't do that. The heart muscle cells don't repair the same, same way as the skin or liver, and as a result, the heart muscle becomes damaged. And in the process of trying to understand why that occurs, in other words, why the heart muscle cells don't uh, divide or repair after, after they become injured, we realized that many of the same genes and proteins that regulate this in the heart also are involved in cancer. And so part of my lab is also interested in studying cancer biology and what we've been able to learn from cancer heart disease that several of the several of the underlying mechanisms, meaning that the processes that actually lead to disease are very similar. And so we're able to study both in my lab. Interesting. Yeah, we don't often think about, you know, 
the flip side of those problems that you know a problem in one area could be the total opposite of the problem in the other area um, and so your lab is called the cardiac gene biology lab but so for some yes. of our viewers out there could you give a simple description of you know like what are genes and how do they impact right. heart disease or right. the risks for heart disease right so um you know with within our cells cells make up the body uh, tissues and the tissues make up the organs the organs of course are part of the body within our cells uh, within within a region within the cell a special place a special house within the cell that we call the nucleus lives uh, DNA and DNA is really the blueprint of um, what makes life life and what makes us who we are and so within this blueprint um, is the uh, information for what we call our genes genetic information and this genetic information is no different than if we were to build a house if we were to build a house we would need a plan and this plan would be let's say a blueprint but the blueprint calls for a foundation it calls for certain dimension of walls and type of insulation and a roof and a kitchen and washroom facilities etc and all that is laid out in this blueprint it's the same thing within ourselves this genetic blueprint is within our dna and that dna um, is really uh, important for this, you know determining the type of uh, proteins and the proteins are really the building blocks that make up the cell structure so in an analogous manner the blueprint for a house put up the walls the, the walls would be the proteins and the proteins work together kind of like a lego set they inter interconnect and very much like the genes in our in our dna are responsible for making these proteins that sometimes um, become damaged and when the protein becomes damaged the cell uh, doesn't work well and ultimately uh, dies and it's no longer repaired and particularly in the heart that's the problem and so the heart's ability to pump blood uh, decreases as I mentioned earlier and as a result leads to heart failure mm -hmm. so our interest really is to understand this genetic blueprint uh, in more detail and to understand the proteins that are responsible for building our cells and ultimately responsible for um, the building blocks that um, when unfortunately become dismantled cause the house to fall down in an analogous manner causing heart disease yeah so i've seen i've read a little bit about your lab and we talk about it sometimes when we have students in at the research center but that uh, the idea is interesting that you actually have genes that have the code or message to tell your cells when to die is that that's, that's right? correct yeah it's very interesting within the within the blueprint um uh, there are genes that instruct the cells when to live and they also instruct the cells when to die and when there's a mismatch or imbalance between the two then uh, problems occur if the cells don't die when they're supposed to then there's too much accumulation or you know build up mm -hmm. of, of the different uh, proteins and the typically results in cancer but mm -hmm. it also impairs the uh, normal function of the cell and if there are not enough of these proteins or uh, instructions for the, for the cell to remove these damaged proteins or um, otherwise the cells will, will die and that will also cause disease so there's a balance between the survival genes and the death promoting genes and that's all mapped out in our in our blueprint within our, within our dna hmm. that's super interesting and also clearly is going to impact a lot of people because if you're approaching both ends of that spectrum looking at cancer and at heart failure that your lab findings are bound to help a lot of people as those are the two biggest killers yes so in fact we've developed new agents um, that treat uh, heart disease at the genetic level in the past what's happened is that different drugs have been developed and they don't cure the heart disease they simply act as band-aids you know, mm. if a person had high blood pressure, they would be given a drug that would lower the blood pressure, but it doesn't cure the actual cause of the blood pressure. What mm. we're working on now, uh, elevated blood pressure, um, what we're working on now are special type of uh, drugs 
that actually work at the blueprint level, at the genetic level, wow. as a way, way to, like a gene therapy approach to cure uh, the heart disease. And, um, you know, this is something that's quite exciting for us. It uh, has tremendous implication for people who have heart disease, uh, which is very apparent in our, uh, in our communities. Yeah, so I noticed that recently um, you were the recipient of the Research Achievement Award from the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. So that yes. that title kind of implies that it's like the all of your research that you're being awarded for, but is it based on any particular discoveries or anything that you've made? Yeah, it, I'm very honored by it. I think it's, uh, you know, humbled because there are many people who uh, before me have received this award. The award was given based upon um, the work that we've done in this field. And it's basically um, a culmination of, of research activities. I think, though, that one of, the, one of the research components that we're very excited about is our work on cell death, that we have discovered a gene that does get switched on when people are having heart attacks. And, and I mentioned when, when the oxygen delivery to the heart muscle cells is decreased, um, it causes the heart muscle to uh, stop contracting properly. And we identified a particular gene that gets literally switched on when that happens. Mm -hmm. And we've also found ways to prevent that gene from being turned on. And we after prevent the heart someone's muscle. had a heart attack yeah. or yeah. ahead of time if you know they're Just at high risk? After, after, the, after the gene. We, we found that if we prevent the gene from being turned on, we can prevent the heart muscle damage. Wow. And now we're looking at ways to actually prevent that from occurring because we can't predict who and when people are going to have heart attacks. I mean, it, it happens, but we can we can certainly help treat uh, them, uh, treat people uh, who are having heart attacks to lessen the damage. Hmm. So the Research Achievement Award, I believe, was really an honor for the work that we've done in the field and advancing the field, and, you know, adding to the complexity of uh, trying to solve this, this complex problem. It is a really complex problem. And you sent me an article um, from one of your staff, Dr. Ina Rabinovich Nikitin. I'm just going to pull it up here so that people can see. So you can't see it, but the viewers can. Um, so this is Dr. Ina Rabinovich Nikitin, and her paper is called Circadian Regulated Cell Death in Cardiovascular Disease. Um, and I was so impressed while reading this at uh, at just how dense the information is in this paper. Um, so circadian regulated, so that basically is talking about the day-night cycle that we go through. So the day-night cycle actually impacts people's risk for having cardiovascular disease or heart problems like that's talking about incident of heart attacks and blood pressure. Can you explain yes. a little bit about yes. that research? Thank you for bringing this up um, and reading our paper. Um, the, the work is really kind of cool. I'll explain why it's really cool. It's cool because it addresses uh, circadian biology. And what is the circadian? Circadian is a, a program that's, again, built within, our, within the blueprint of our DNA that tells genes to turn on and turn off at different times of the day. So when we're sleeping, there are certain genes that are turned off and we're all awake. There are certain genes that are turned on and they regulate. When we eat, if we're hungry, they regulate. When we um, do physical activity, um, all these different activities that we do are all rhythmic. And that means that they, they follow a pattern. They go up and they come down. They go up and they come down. So it turns out that when you disrupt this pattern, when people are either jet lagged, they've traveled for great distances and they haven't slept well, or if they're shift workers. In other words, we normally sleep in the evening and we're awake during the day, and it follows the sunrise and sunset. And so in the morning when the sun comes up, our eyes and body get activated and we're ready for the day. And toward eight, nine o'clock, when you get a little older, you start getting tired and that's time to go to bed. And uh, the idea is that's all regulated by the day uh, night cycle. Mm -hmm. And so we were curious to know if different forms of heart disease occur at different times of the day. And the answer is yes. And so depending upon 
if the circadian rhythm is disrupted, such as in shift workers, because those individuals are sleeping during the day when the rest of us are awake, and they are awake at night when the rest of us are sleeping, they are more susceptible, we found, to developing heart disease. Hmm. And this is a big issue because there are many shift workers. Uh, they have, more, you know, they have, they have uh, uh, different jobs that require them to work at different times of the day. And we discovered the fact that there's a greater risk for heart disease in these individuals. And the same thing with jet lag. Um, people who are um, traveling across an eight-hour, you know, time zone. If we're going from Winnipeg to uh, Paris. There's an eight-hour time change. Um, if we don't sleep or catch up, we, we become more susceptible to uh, cardiac disease. So the work that Ina did, and Ina is uh, what's called a postdoctoral fellow. She has her completed her PhD studies and then came to my lab to learn more about heart disease as uh, specialty training. And so that's one thing that we do in Winnipeg quite well is we recruit from all over the world. Ina came to us from Israel. She's been now with us for close to four years. Very highly, highly skilled individual. And she's now learning about cardiac biology and learning about how the circadian uh, influences heart disease. And so the article that uh, you refer to is a paper we published that identifies how the circadian influences heart disease and why keeping, and, 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 and that relationship, you know, why is it important and how is it important to mm -hmm. maintain normal cardiac health. Yeah, so some of the things that I noticed from it are that, you know, most heart attacks or like um, acute heart conditions happen in the morning yes. rather than in the evening. And there were even some implications, you know, for how to treat patients in hospital, like when to take certain medicines, or it talked a little bit about, you know, when people are in the ICU in the intensive care unit, they're at a particularly high risk because they're being constantly monitored and there's lots of noise and artificial light and whatnot. But even from, not from within the hospital, but if you look at, you know, like societal issues, even outside of shift work, like things like technology, we hear a lot about like artificial lights affecting the same pathways that our brains use to understand that daylight is when we should be active. Do you think that there are going to be like more long-term implications of those technologies and things that are affecting that circadian cycle in like young people today? Are we going to see an effect of that in the future? Yeah, I think it's a great, great question, great comment. So um, one of the things that we all have now, or most of us have, are um, smartphones. Yeah, of course. Uh, right we have tablets, and you have yours. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and there's mine. And they're always and so, binging, and you know, and, lots and of people always, don't turn them off and, at night. And, so. and, and, they're all, and they're always on, and they're always telling us that something is going on. But here's something that's really interesting, especially with, with younger people, maybe not so much with older people, but particularly with, with younger people, they lay in bed, and they'll either read or they'll play games, video games or uh, surf the net or whatever, mm -hmm. on their phones or I, I, uh, tablets. The thing with these uh, devices, as great as they are, they're what are called blue light emitters. So the light basically is a spectrum. We have from blue to red, and it's very much like if you took a prism and you kind of refracted the light and get this really beautiful prism, just like a rainbow from red to, to, uh, to blue. Um, our, our circadian is really regulated by light, light dark cycle. And so the light comes into our eyes and it gets processed in our brain, and it activates a number of neural pathways, and that basically drives the clock, our internal body clock. Hmm. So the problem is with the with these blue light emitters, um, the, the tablets and the iPhone and the uh, smartphones, is is that they um, reset the circadian uh, because our eyes see we don't see the blue light, but the blue light is there because hmm. of the LCD screen, and we're unaware of it. And subconsciously what happens is the blue light actually changes um, our circadian so we don't feel like we want to sleep. And so many people become sleep deprived or they have trouble falling asleep. And as a result, um, you know, they next morning, they're cranky and unhappy. And uh, potentially that's just one way, but um, one, one aspect of it, but they're also greater susceptible to uh, uh, disease. Uh, and that's largely because of the fact that their circadian biology is, is now messed up. So um, when you ask the question about the technologies, as great as they are, 
one of the uh, issues that we're now realizing is, as uh, doctors, researchers, um, that the, uh, these, these tablets and uh, smartphones are actually contributing to uh, some forms of, uh, of illness. Hmm. And also, a thing that I've been thinking about is maybe a bit how, you know, basic things like sleep, but that we not basic as in it's simple, because we don't understand so much about sleep and what happens in the body, but that if that was an approach to disease prevention, you know, addressing sleep issues, that seems like it underlies or causes shifts in a lot of other health areas. Like having a good sleep makes you crave different foods even when you're awake, yeah. you're able to be more active yeah. if you're not tired. Um, yeah. We had some questions about, actually Steve was wondering, you know, so if you, if your heart rate is already higher in the morning, you have higher blood pressure, even though it's really dark out when we get up first thing in the morning, is it good to go into exercising right away? Like, is early morning a good point to exercise because your heart's already really agitated, or is that worsening the problem? Or what are some of the things that people can do to... We can right. affect the amount of daylight where we live, so what are some of the, yeah. the options that we have? So, so you ask a very complicated but yet important question. Okay, so um, typically... We only have about two minutes, just so you okay. know. So, so, so the answer is that, um, I'll, I'll go very quickly with this. The answer is some people um, are, uh, are are more interested in working out in the morning. Some are morning people, some are uh, afternoon people or evening mm -hmm. people, the night, the night owls. So they want to work out in the evening. It comes down to their uh, psychological and personal makeup. Um, the fact that heart rate is higher in the morning um, doesn't necessarily mean we should necessarily go exercise in the morning, but it's one of the symptomologies that people suggest are you know, a cause of why heart attacks are greater in the morning because blood pressure is also higher in the morning. And if it's a susceptible individual, um, they, they may experience greater risk for, for uh, heart attack, um, heart damage, whether it's circadian dependent or not. Hmm. Um, well, a lot of people have mood disorders. Um, and what I mean by that is that they have seasonal depression. And that's because we have a large, uh, you know, like now, um, if you take a look, it gets dark pretty quick out. Um, in the morning, you can go to work when it's dark, and depending on what you're doing coming home, it can be dark. And that, if, the, the light in particular affects a lot of people. And so um, the way to treat that is uh, some people are using light therapy, mm -hmm. and they will sit in front of a, a light with a certain intensity with, with a, within a given spectrum of light for a certain period of time to mimic the sun. And that helps with some of these depressive illnesses and, uh, affective disorders that people occur that occur in people um, associated with seasonal depression. So it's it's helps reset the clock. It helps reset the circadian. So the question about the exercising in the morning or afternoon is is um, complicated. But uh, definitely people who have exercise in the afternoon uh, or later in the day have better performance. Um, they are able to run farther or work out better because that's just the way our body is, and that's why. You know they're they're greater set up for afternoon activity than morning. So, but I agree that a certain amount of sleep is very important. Some people can get away with five hours. Some people need ten. But the amount of sleep is really critical, especially if you're a young person and you need to go to school and uh, study and homework and do mm -hmm. other activities. I felt very validated by this research because Ina, Dr. Rubinovich uh, Nikitin, she described a chronotype as in that it's a very real thing that some people are morning active people and some people are late active people and i am so inactive in the morning i just don't understand uh like my boss steve who gets up and goes and works out at five in the morning and then comes to work it's a totally but it's you know people legitimately have very genetic differences or physiological differences um so that was very interesting for me so again, I think we're gonna probably lose our connection pretty soon, but we like to ask all of our guests, um, you know, a little bit about more about themselves. So, you know, if you you obviously are very involved in cardiovascular disease and science research, but if you weren't a scientist, what would you be doing with your life? I'd be a photographer. Oh, interesting. So my, my interest my interest in photography probably also has a uh, combination of both art and uh, well let me qualify that art and science because you know the art it, I, I think what we do honestly 
as, as a researcher, it's, it's really art and science. Let me explain. So the art we do is really creative. We have a blank slate and we have to solve a problem. And we know that we're working backwards, kind of reverse engineering heart disease, so what causes it? And so when we do an experiment, it's, it's really creative. It's really creative ideas of how to design an experiment, how to approach a, set, uh, a, a given problem. The, the language is really the science. And, and so that's why this is you know, kind of like a medical art. And uh, that's how I see it. Photography, much the same way. The photography is really the, what you capture, what you see in terms of you know, artistic uh, uh, creativity. The science is really the camera, the f-stop, the shutter speed type of film. All of that is the science behind it. But um, the other thing I wanted to say is I'd probably be a chef. I do like cooking. But um, you know the way I've been cooking these days, not so good. Uh, too much chopping and not enough stuff. But um, anyway, I, I, I have a passion for food and eating and cooking. And uh, I probably wouldn't be a very good chef, but I would probably be a pretty OK photographer. Hmm. That's interesting. There are actually quite a few photographers around the building. And it's an important part of like providing information based on our research. Like There's a lot of cell microscopy photos involved and making lots of proteins show up as very pretty colors. Um, but that's, yeah, it's an interesting one. OK, so one last question then. Has your history of research and heart disease affected the way that you approach your own personal health? Uh, what a beautiful question. I love that. So the answer is yes. Um, I work out regularly. I do watch what I eat. I do enjoy burgers and fries like everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think everything in moderation. Um, of course, uh, that's, that's the only way to, uh, to, to stay healthy. Um, you know, nevertheless, you can try doing, living a healthy lifestyle, but still develop heart disease. That just goes without saying. Sometimes genetics you can't control. But I think uh, being aware um, that cigarette smoking and excessive alcohol and uh, other types of, you know, extra. But like a little bit of red wine is okay, right? Oh, red wine That's is great. Uh, but I think everything, you know, I love red wine too. But I think everything in moderation is what's really important. And um, you know, to say that you can't have uh, you know a, a greasy hamburger once in a while um, would be right. But if you have it every day and you're overweight and not you know very active, uh, I think it would be a problem. So yes, the answer is I'm very aware of my heart health, and I try to stay healthy. My lab tries to stay healthy. I think that's the message that we're conveying to young people. I visit often uh, elementary and high school students. Um, they visit us, and the message that I pitch is. Uh, preventive medicine, preventive heart health, because it starts at an early age. And I think people now, young kids now, are you know, more apt to play you know, soccer uh, and, and sports on, on you know, uh, PlayStation uh, than in, in the old days where they were running around the soccer pitch, uh, you know, kicking the ball. So yeah. both are fun. I love video games just as the next. But the uh, point is to be outside and walk and run and skate and play yeah. hockey and football. Move your body and eat good food. Move your right? body. Yeah. And get a really good sleep. I'm going to try and push for the later start times over here. We later can get start. some rest. Um, OK, well, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Megan. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm going to go Bye, everyone. on the screen. But thank you very much. Um, and so to our viewers, Thanks for coming and joining our Meet a Scientist series today. So next week, we're going to have Dr. Peter Zaradka and Dr. Carla Taylor here from the Canadian Center for Agri-Food Research and Health and Medicine. So they're going to share with us a little bit about what some of those foods are that you might be able to eat to help prevent disease. And you can also make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for updates or check us out at youthbiolab.ca or follow us at youthbiolab on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you for 